Good afternoon. It is afternoon here where we are at least, isn't yes, it, darling? It is. And again, we wanted to discuss another Paget message with you today. And so what we've chosen is a very, very short and succinct message by Solomon on the 20th of April 1916 that he gave it. And the subject of the message is what are the greatest truths in all the world? And it's a very short, direct message, but you're going to find that it will probably take an hour or so to discuss it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because there's so, much, uh, there's so much involved in his statements about the, uh, the truth that is discussed in this message. So what we'd probably like to do is read the entire message first, I feel, yeah. and then um, we can then bring out the different points with the, with the discussion. So um, I thought perhaps I would read the message and then we'll proceed. <clears throat> Solomon of the Old Testament, I come only to say that very soon I, shall, I desire to write you another message, conveying to you some great truth of the Father. I will not write more now, but will soon come. And then Paget asks, what is the greatest thing in all the world? Prayer and faith on the part of mortals and love, the divine love, on the part of God. The latter is waiting, and the former causes it to enter into the souls of men. No other truths are so great and momentous to men. Let what I say sink deep into your memory, and try the experiment. I know you do try, but try, and then try, and never cease trying. Love will come to you, and with it faith, and then knowledge, and then ownership. I could write for a long time, yet I must not, as you are tired. So with my love and blessings, I will say good night, and may the Father's love take possession of you. Your brother in Christ, Solomon. So a very short message. Yeah, it's actually <laughs> probably my favourite message. Out in of, the pageant messages? Yeah, out of all the messages. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think because it's so, the message is so um, crystallised mm -hmm. and beautiful mm -hmm. and... If I could master the prayer and faith, <laughs> I yeah, know what I would I feel come. it's one of the most misunderstood messages in the entire pageant messages as well. Which is it? why I'm really excited to talk to you about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I feel it's misunderstood from the, from the point of view, from, from many different points of view, but the first point of view that it's very misunderstood is the importance of prayer. Mm -hmm. I just feel that most people, when they hear about praying for divine love, still do not understand the importance of prayer and what prayer actually does to the soul and what prayer for love does in terms of transformation of the soul. Mm -hmm. And I also feel it's important in the sense that it highlights the most important thing we can receive from God. A lot of people are seeking truth, but, but the reality is they're not seeking this primary truth, and that is the, the most important thing that you could ever receive is love from God. Yeah. That is the transformation, that is the thing that causes transformation of the human soul. You can try to transform your soul using all other methods or find out lots of other truths if you want, but the reality is this is the most important thing you can receive. And I feel that most people who listen to us still don't understand that. Still, mm -hmm. They're still seeking truth about this subject or that subject or whatever it is that they are trying to get truth about and still not understanding the, that the, the greatest single greatest truths are this love that can come from God that transforms your soul and what you need to do to actually have this love to enter your soul, it. to yeah. receive it. Yeah. And, and if people understood this truth better, they would spend less of their time arguing or, point or, or, or seeking other types of knowledge. Mm -hmm metaphysical or, or other types of knowledge. They, they, would, they would even probably stop ceasing it, searching for it, cease altogether mm -hmm. and focus only, if they understood the true importance of receiving divine love into the soul, they would seek only for that first. And it, it would become, as I said in the first century, you'd seek that first and all these other things would be added to you and they would understand that. But I feel the majority of people do not understand it. So this is one reason why we'd like to discuss it yeah. together in detail. And in, in this message, Solomon says to Paget, try the experiment. Mm. And, um, that's and then try and try and try and, try and keep trying. Keep and never trying. <laughs> and maybe we can point out what the experiment is, which mm. is really something that um, we've talked about in other discussions 
where um, Paget has encouraged his spirit friends mm. to experiment with the idea that if there is a God who loves me, mm. then I would ask for that love. Mm. And um, Solomon is basically saying, just as, as you've said, that's the greatest thing you can ever try to mm. do. Mm. And, and when you do, it's going, to, it's going to change you. Love will come to you and then faith and then knowledge and ownership mm. and and um, I just find that so beautiful the way he's been able to say it so clearly. What's going to happen if we just have these two qualities? Yeah. Or so, two actions, I suppose. Yeah, so perhaps we can talk firstly about the importance of God's love and what it does to the soul. Great. Because that, that is the thing that comes from God. And what Solomon says is the greatest thing that comes from God. And I, I would agree with that. The greatest thing that I've experienced from God is this love that comes from God. It transforms everything else. It gives you all knowledge in the end as well. If you put it into practice in your day-to-day -day life, all other knowledge comes to you as well. So if, if we really valued it, we would place it as a high priority in our life. In fact, if we valued it to, the, to its worth, in other words, if we valued God's love, to what God's love was actually worth, mm -hmm. we would find that we'd be spending a lot less time doing mundane things in our day-to-day -day life and a lot more time developing this relationship with God than the majority of us are doing. So this, I feel, indicates that for the majority of us, we do not value God's love and we do not understand its transformational nature upon the soul. And instead what we do is we're still self-reliant, we're still relying on some effort on our behalf, and as a result we often get very distracted. We often go off into searching for other truths rather than focusing all of our intention on this one main truth and then allowing all the other truths to come to us as time goes on. As we receive the love, more and more of these truths will come to us. And I feel that... Uh, for the majority of people who've heard the message of divine truth, there is still a focus on all of the truth without there being a major focus on all of the love that we can receive from God. Because it's not the truth that transforms us. And we need to understand that. Mm -hmm. We need to get that it's not truth that transforms us. It opens the doorway to transforming us, but it isn't the truth itself that transforms us. It's love that transforms us. And it's not our own love that transforms us. It's God's love entering the soul that transforms us. And we need to understand the importance of receiving God's love in our day-to-day -day life if we truly want to become more loving individuals. So can you then describe this? You're saying God's love transforms us. Mm -hmm. Can you explain <coughs> it, it, what happens? What is this transformation that happens? Well, when God's love, when God's love, the, which is a part really or a part of God's nature and, and character, and as in, we've said in the pageant messages, it's a part of the substance of God mm -hmm. because it belongs to God. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. So when we, when we receive divine love into our soul, a part of God now exists within our soul for the very first time, if it's the very first time we've received it, it'll be the very first time in our entire existence that a part of God exists in our soul. Now, a lot of people argue that we're all made with a part of God, and I can't agree with that. Yeah. We are all made with uh, characteristics and attributes that are loving, and God has placed these characteristics and attributes in us, but they belong to us initially without being a part of God. And, and God made the material that makes up our body and made the material that makes up our spirit body and made the material that makes up our soul, but they are just creations of God that have their own, their own purpose and their own mechanisms. Mm -hmm. They operate independently of God. And God created it that way because otherwise we wouldn't have free will. When we receive divine love, it's completely different. We now are receiving a part of God's very substance, the love that belongs to God, which is an emotion that God has, but it's also a substance, that enters our soul and starts transforming the soul into a different type, of, having different type of characteristics. And it physically transforms the soul as well as spiritually transforms it. And, and it does it by operating upon this love causes different operations to begin inside of the human soul. Mm -hmm. so, so before, we were only ever able to progress to the perfect natural man 
after we've received some divine love, now we have the potentiality of receiving more and more of this love that transforms us into being a completely different kind of creature, which is why I called it in the first century the, the new birth, being born again. It's, you're born from being just a man, born of mo a mother and a father, if you like, the soul created by God, but, uh, but unind you know, unindividualized before you incarnate. When it incarnates, it individualizes, but it still isn't conscious of the fact that it's got a part of God in it because the reality is it does not have a part of God in it at that point, mm -hmm. with the exception of that God formed the materials that, that made up the soul. But they aren't actually made from God's substance, are they? No, no they're, they're the... God formulating material from the universe, formulating materials to create our soul and create a spirit body and create our physical body, but a part of God's actual substance doesn't exist in the human. Yeah. So this whole concept that, you know, we are all divine sparks of God is a very flawed concept because of the reality, and I feel the earth we're living on is proof that we're not all, <laughs> yes, we're not all divine sparks of God at all because you, you, you see the results of the world that we yeah. live in and you see quite plainly that if we're all divine sparks of God, then God must be a pretty harsh and yeah. unloving person. So, but once we start receiving divine love into our soul, now a part of God enters us. Uh -huh. For the very first time in our existence, we have the potential for immortality. And once God's love has, once we've become at one with God's love that's, that, that enters us and, and continues to enter us to the point where every choice and every decision we make is in harmony with the law, mm -hmm. then we are at one, one with God. And once we become at one with God, now we are also completely immortal. We, we can never, our soul, not our spirit body or a physical body, but our soul can never die. It can never go, be passed away. It can never be transformed into something lesser than what it currently is. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify, though, you're saying a part of God has entered us. Yes. But this is not a process of us becoming God, is it? No. This, when we become at one with God, it's not saying that so much of God has entered us that we are God, is it? Well, I suppose if you look at the very furthest potential in terms of receiving divine love, it, it is possible that somehow we become a part of God. However, I, I don't, nobody has ever experienced that. There's yeah. no spirit who's ever experienced that or any person on earth has ever experienced that. And so, and so the reality is we don't know what the future will be receiving divine love. Mm -hmm. All we know at this point in time is that divine love transforms us into a completely new creature with completely new potentials. And these potentials are not, and it's like God is gifting new gifts to our soul that we didn't have as a part of our original potential, mm -hmm. but God created the soul able to un expand under the condition of receiving divine love. It's only under that condition. And our will has to be engaged in that. It's not something that's automatic. It's, we're not automatically divine. We've got to engage our will. We've got to decide that we want to become such through this relationship with God. And, and by divine, I don't mean that we become God. I mean that we have part of God's divinity within us because we have a part of God's love within us. Uh -huh. The substance of God has entered our soul and transformed it. Okay, so, and this will part, that's the prayer and faith that we're going to talk about later, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. But just if you could speak a little bit more about this transformation, you say we become at one with God, but what begins to happen initially that we start to receive God's love? There's a change that's happening and part of God is entering us. But what in effect is, are things leaving us? What, what's, ha what's changing within us? Well, nothing leaves us when we receive divine love mm -hmm. we, without our choice being involved. So in other words, when we receive love from God, Nothing will leave us. No errors will leave us. No truth can enter us unless our will is engaged. And this is where I feel a lot of people uh, do not understand the principle of receiving divine love. They, they want more love, but oftentimes they receive some. If you look at most religious faiths, uh, there is a connection to God in some places. And, and so they receive some divine love, but then their belief systems and their will is exercised to reject more love. Mm -hmm. to, to stop having love come into the soul. Or they reject living in harmony with the love mm -hmm. that has already entered their soul. And if they do that, then they'll have quite a lot of pain and suffering in their lives still as a result of that. What we need to do is engage this process of continuing to receive the love and releasing from us the, 
influences and, and beliefs and emotions and passions and desires within us that give us uh, have a tendency towards rejection of the love and they have a tendency towards rejection of the truth and we need to let, let those go, but it needs to be a process that is actively engaged by our will. We can't expect to just have divine love keep coming to us while at the same time we continue to operate and, and act out of harmony with it and, and, and have continued reception of divine love. The divine love has, uh, because of the, the substance of it, because it comes from God, it, it has a, an underlying responsibility, if you like, and the underlying responsibility is that we start acting in harmony with it in order to receive more. Uh -huh. right? So that, that's a part and parcel of the reception of divine love. But the, it's the divine love that actually transforms the soul. Nothing else does. In what way does it transform the soul? Well, physically it transforms the soul from just the perfect natural man or from the, per, from the normal soul that we're created and by, by softening it into a different type of soul. Yep. It actually is a different type of soul. And in fact, the spirits in the spirit world, when you speak to them who haven't received divine love, they actually believe that the souls of those who have received divine love are different souls. And, and, and while it's not true that it's not available to everybody, because it is, um, they believe that, that it must be a different soul because when they look at the spirit body of the individuals who have received divine love and they feel them, they can feel that there's something completely different in these people compared to themselves. Mm -hmm. And so they then start judging it as, oh, it must mean that God created two types of souls. Sure. And that's how they explain to themselves. So you're saying physically the spiritual body begins to reflect the changes that are inside the soul and that's what spirits are seeing? Yes, but I'm also saying that the, the soul itself, the physicality of the soul itself, changes on the reception of divine love. Mm -hmm. The soul changes its substance and form mm -hmm. for the very first time. If you never receive divine love, it, there will not be this change. Mm -hmm. that you, you'll continue to grow and you eventually become the perfected natural man sometime in your future in the spirit world, in the sixth dimension. You'll be very happy perhaps in that state, but you'll never experience any further growth. Mm -hmm. And it's impossible, in fact, to experience any further growth without receiving divine love above the sixth dimension. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is understand that receiving divine love is the beginning of all soul-based transformation, really. Because even if you grow in natural love, Transformation can occur, but it, but it halts at the sixth dimension. Mm -hmm. It cannot continue. Mm -hmm. so, so, and the reason why it cannot continue is because the soul that hasn't received divine love hasn't been transformed into this new creature that has the ability to exponentially grow and change and, and infinitely grow and change. Mm -hmm. That's the effect that divine love has upon the soul. It allows now the soul, so it's sort of almost like a key that you can put into the soul yeah. and transform it from being one type of vehicle, if you like, yeah. to a completely different type of vehicle with far with a completely jet different potentiality. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't even call it jet propulsion. I'd say it's like a completely different vehicle altogether. It's like comparing a, a, a motor car with a, with a 747 jet plane, you're playing, sure. you know, like um, in the sense of comparison and intric intricacies that can be developed within the soul. One is in comparison although it looked quite complex, is quite simple in comparison to the other. Divine love causes the transformation of the physical soul. Uh -huh. It also, the way that it does it is by the substance of God entering the soul and opening up all of these different possibilities that God created, potentialities in the soul, that cannot be opened by anything other than love, that God's love. Right. So that's how it does it. it, uh -huh. it when divine love is experienced in the soul, it opens up, it's like a little... It's like this uh, underlying substance, if you like, that, that causes a hole there, a new hole there, and a new growth 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 there. And all of a sudden, the soul is now growing in all these different areas that all had to have a certain key put in them, which is just the divine love is the key to it all, had to have the key put into it in order for that growth to occur. If divine love is not received, none of that growth can ever occur. Physically ever. Right. So uh, thinking now of me mm -hmm. back here, mm -hmm. I'm not at one with God yet. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm very in my infancy, the second time around, <laughs> in receiving God's love. Yeah. 
And so when you're talking about this... Uh, I can't agree with those statements, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, how would you differ with those statements? Well, there, there is other messages which we'll discuss in the future, how a person can act out of harmony with the love they've already received. And the reality is you're, you have been acting out of harmony with the love you've already received, which is a very different operation than the person receiving divine love for the first time. Yes. And so maybe we should just give a hypothetical then. <laughs> okay, let's go for the yes, hypothetical. <laughs> because obviously I have received God's love to the point of one with God mm -hmm. in the past. Mm -hmm. And now I'm back here. And, and the soul, your, our soul still is in that condition. Yes. It even though you might not be conscious of the condition. <laughs> yeah, hasn't yeah. lost the love. And sometimes no. a lot of the pain I experience is because I am acting in disharmony with what I can already, there's already a soul sense in me of exactly. what is loving. Exactly. So comparing yourself to, or asking questions about yourself is probably not something for the general public to benefit from. I feel no. what we need to do <laughs> yeah. is ask questions about what's it like about receiving it for the first time or, yes. or continually receiving it after you've received yeah. it a little bit. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So now I'm Joe Bloggs, mm -hmm. who's never received divine. Or Jody Bloggs. Jody Bloggs. <laughs> <laughs> Joanne Bloggs. <laughs> 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 um, you're talking about this transformation of the soul. Mm -hmm. Now, I, Mary Magdalene, know more about what you're talking about. But mm. if I was hearing this for the first time, I, you're talking about a changing in substance. You're talking about potentials being unlocked in me. But what are... Um, I'm assuming it, it's a potential for more truth, a potential to experience more love? What are, What's the benefits? Why would I want divine love? Well, it's the potential for you to feel like God feels on on every literally every issue that you could ever raise. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when you uh, look at a situation that you currently see as painful, um, once you've received divine love to the point of one with God, you'll look upon that situation as God looks upon it you will actually feel the way God feels about that situation. So instead of time. feeling fear and pain, you might feel compassion and intense love. And you'll feel completely different feelings. Yes. Yeah, and, and as a result of that, you'll also feel extreme, ha extreme happiness all the time. Not, you, there'll be no limitation to your happiness because your happiness can continue to grow. Yeah. So I, think, I, th I feel that the fir first positive benefit is the fact that eventually I will become like God in my feelings. Mm -hmm. Now, if a person imagines what that... It, now, it's very hard for, of course, for it. This is the problem with receiving divine love, is, it, is that most people do not desire things unless they know what the outcome is. Yes. Right? But the problem with uh, receiving divine love is, that, if you could say there is a problem, is that the majority of people on earth has no idea about what the po possible outcomes are of receiving divine love, and as a result of that, they don't have an intense desire for it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they understood all of the possibilities and truly felt them in their heart, they, they would not, it would, it would be the, the thing they sought for the most in their life, mm. not the least, mm. or, or just as a side thought or just as some kind of side idea. They would be totally and completely and utterly focused on actually wanting to have this love to that point. Yeah. They, they would not be distracted by any other things other than receiving this love if they understood the benefits. Yes. So you're saying one of the benefits is that at the point of at one moment with God, I will feel what God feels about any given situation. And God is never sad. No. And God is always happy. Yeah. And God is always loving. So you will always become, you will always be loving in every de dealing you have. Now, just to clarify that, then I've had people say, well, then I've lost my individuality. Where's the point? Where's my personality if I just become... And, the, and I would argue that what they, they're still not understanding what's being offered to them. Yes. Because they're offer, that what's being offered to them is a purification of their personality to its pure nature, mm -hmm. not, not an absorption into God. Yeah. Because we're still an individual. In fact, the more we progress in love, the more individual we become. That is what God designed us to be, an individual. Yeah. That's why the whole process of, of incarnation is called individualization. <laughs> it's about creating an individual, uh -huh. you, and, and having this individual growing to a limited perspective if they don't want to receive divine love, or having the individual grow for, to an unlimited condition which, which will, will be dependent upon continually receiving divine love, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, if they understood that their personality is never going to be lost in this and the exercise of their will is never going to be lost in this process, 
then many people might seek for it more. Yeah. But there is this common belief on the planet that when you connect with God, you give up your will and yes. you give all your will over to God. Now, of course, that doesn't sound very attractive to most people <laughs> and I can understand to a degree why that, that they don't feel that's attractive. And, and so because they feel like their own personal nature will be absorbed, right, and that is not the case at all. And a lot of people feel the colour and uh, change and um, character of their life is defined by their highs and lows emotionally and they don't have a sense that actually you can feel happy all of the time. And still express your personality. And still express your personality and you would be far more creative and you will have a lot more... Um, character and vibrancy in your life yeah. you just won't be experiencing hardship or pain correct yeah so the some other advantages as well are things like once we become at one with god we gain some of the qualities that god has and one of those qualities is the ability to transport ourselves from place to place quite easily um, we we gain the quality of being able to sense and feel the individual, every individual that surrounds us, what their character is, what their nature is, what emotions they have within them, what history they have, without even having to talk to them. We have the ability to know them, truly know them, without having to actually converse with them. So, so, so that's a, a major ability that we gain once we become at one with God. Well, that is, that is more than awareness, isn't it? We have an, an, an intense awareness, but it's not from... We actually also have a, a connection and a compassion with each individual as well, would you say? Of course, because yeah. the love itself generates compassion. Yes. It doesn't generate, though, a sadness within yourself. Mm -hmm. So while you know everything that's going on around you and you know all the reasons why people are making the choices around you, you still do not feel sad that they're making those choices because you realise that those choices were based upon the gift of free will that God gave them. And you're completely in harmony with God's idea that that's a great thing. Yes. <laughs> it's a great thing they've yeah. been given free will, even the free will to create their own pain and suffering. Mm. They've been given as a gift. So, um, like, the, and you're completely in harmony with God with regard to the use of free will. You also uh, have the ability to create now at the time of inception of an idea or a concept. Mm -hmm. So rather than creating just by having to do physical effort all the time, you now have the ability to create around you and physically create, I'm talking about, have things manifest around you through the process of your soul's engagement of desire. So, so that's a huge, that's how God creates. And that's, we, we gain a lot of these gifts if we continue progressing towards God past the point of atonement and continue after that point. We eventually gain a lot of these abilities um, that God has. Yeah. In our soul. And um, so you're talking about creation happening just seamlessly as, as, as we have and our emotions are in harmony with God. So as we have a loving idea mm -hmm. um, and also in response to what we feel around us because we have this awareness of everyone around us and mm -hmm. we have a connection to them and a love for them, then every action we take is going to be in harmony with love of them and ourselves mm -hmm. and our creations also will be in harmony with that. Love. Exactly. So, And we're not only creating here, we're creating in multidimensional spaces yep. in the universe at the same time and we're aware of that. We're not, it's not that we're unaware, we know that it's happening and we, we know because we can visit those homes that we're creating, for example, and the spaces we've created, and we're able to visit it because now we have the ability not only just to think of ourselves in a human form, but we now have the ability to understand how the spirit body works and how I can see with my spirit body's eyes. And I can. So all of these other uh, advantages come to us automatically mm -hmm. through this process of receiving divine love and having the soul transformed. So um, you... Thank you, given us a pretty um, compelling picture of like what it's like to be. But but to be honest, it's a it's a very limited picture. Sure. You know, because <laughs> because if people understood how immense it was, for example, just the one concept of immortality, if people understood how immense that was, that one concept of immortality, knowing for certain that when you become at one with God, you will. Right. <laughs> when you become a one with God, you will always end up in this place of, of certainty on, on, on all subjects once you become a one with God. And knowing that everything you choose to do is certain, like the outcome is certain, 
if it's in harmony with love. So it's certain in terms of love. Mm. It's not necessarily certain in terms of prophetic things you're talking about. No, humans. no. And I think this is a big misunderstanding yes. most people have about, about receiving divine love. They have this sort of concept that when you receive divine love to it, one went with God, you automatically have all the knowledge of the universe. Now, if you had, that would automatically make you God. And that's not the case. The reality is that once you become at one with God, you have the amount of knowledge you had just before you became at one with God with a, just a touch more love in you that you're now at one with God. <laughs> That's the reality. But, but, but the, the knowledge has the continue, you, you can continue to grow in your knowledge yeah. because it's love, God's love, in fact, the understanding of God's love is what actually operates the entire universe. Mm -hmm. So you're not able to discover anything more about the universe unless you become at one with God. So these, these six fear spirits, for example, who have not received divine love, they're investigating all these different things about the truths of the universe. That's what they're focused on the creation rather than creator, right? So they, they're focused on all of the different things that are happening in the universe, trying to learn more and more, but they're not realizing that they will not be able to learn more and more about it and know it for certain because divine love is the thing they're going to need before they can understand it. Their soul needs to have grown into a different creature to understand it. Mm. The soul has to become more like God's soul in order to understand what God has actually done. Mm -hmm. And while you're holding on to the intellectual idea that you can understand God, right, without transforming your soul into God's nature, you're basically blocking any understanding of God and most understanding of the universe. So, so you have no opportunity in that place to completely understand the universe and what God has created, God's laws and God herself. You have, you have no opportunity to understand God either. The soul has to be developed in love, it, not our own love, but God's love before we can understand those things. Mm -hmm. So there's whole groups of truths that are completely cut off from our understanding unless we receive divine love. Mm -hmm. and, and if we don't receive divine love, we can think we know but we won't know. It won't be an actual, like, like Solomon says here, ownership. It won't be an ownership of our knowledge. We, 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 we will, it'll just be an opportunity to know or an idea or concept of knowledge, but it won't be something that we actually own and feel because, because it's impossible to without receiving divine love. Yeah. And this is like if people understood all of the um, issues surrounding receiving divine love, and the importance of receiving divine love in their day-to-day -day life if they truly want to understand everything, mm -hmm. they, they, they wouldn't be worried about, you know, doing this, doing that, making, you know, fixing this, fixing... They wouldn't be worried about a lot of things in their day-to-day -day life as much as they would be concerned about embracing the principles of... of and particularly embracing God's love into the soul. Sure. So uh, then I have a couple of other point, uh, questions, clarifiers yeah. around what you're saying there. Basically, you're saying that as I receive, well, at the point of one with God, then I have access to understanding from a completely different... No, I'm not saying at the point of one with God. I'm saying that divine love transforming the soul causes the soul to get to new understandings. Now, at the point of divine love being at one with God, that doesn't mean that we all of a sudden know everything. What it means is... Whatever we now know in the future, we, we can only know by receiving more love. We can't know it using any other mechanism. Yes. We can't know it you, you know, using a physical concept or trying to think about it or any of those things. We can't know it that way. And there's a whole, it, there's, there's large amounts of the entire universe with, that God has created that is impossible for us to know unless we continue to receive divine love. Sure. Okay. So, so it's not limited to the point of at one month. No, no. I, I was trying to give a clumsy summary of what you said <laughs> okay. so I can ask my yeah. next question. Fire away. Answer the, so, ask the question. Um, I'm Joanne Bloggs again. Yeah. <laughs> and you've given me an amazing picture of what it's like uh, when I've received God's love to the point of at one with God. Mm -hmm. And as Joanne, I can go, okay, well, that's a, all right. Okay. That seems like a good idea. There's mm -hmm. some incentive there. But what's it going to look like on this journey as I begin to receive God's love? Like, obviously, I'm not going to, am I going to get there in the next fortnight, tomorrow, after one session of but prayer? Can, can you see even the desire to ask the question? 
is already a lack of trust in the process. Absolutely. And, and this is where I feel a lot of people don't understand as well. that they, what, They've just been told this amazing thing. They've been told this amazing thing. And the amazing thing is that your entire life and your entire future and your entire intellectual and uh, aware, uh, knowledge and your awareness and the experiences of your entire life are completely dependent upon receiving divine love. Mm -hmm. And yet the next question most people ask is, what is, you know, what's it going to look like? On what's the it going to look like? And what, why do they ask that question next? Because they, well, this is the next thing I wanted to raise with you. Can we make the point, though? Uh, sure. I, can are I, you, can you I make the point? Yeah. yeah, you go. Um, the reason why they're asking these questions is because they don't believe it. Because if they really believed it, they wouldn't be asking any more questions. Yeah. They'd, be, they'd only want to know how, not, not what, but how they can receive love. Yes. They wouldn't want to know anything else once they fully understood the importance of love in their life. And I feel that's the problem that the majority of people we have, uh, that we speak to have, is that they keep asking what, why, who, where. <laughs> yeah, instead of how. <laughs> instead of how. And, yes. <laughs> and then engaging the how, engaging the process with of faith. how. With faith. Well, you know, we talked to a group of spirits this week, didn't we, where they'd been listening to me speak on this subject for one year. So it's a fair time for spirits because they are hearing every conversation I have with every person. It's not like just a few conversations on the internet or anything. They're listening to every conversation I'm having with every person about the subject of divine love. And yet in one year, they still haven't done anything about it. Mm -hmm. They were still asking what, why, when, <laughs> who, <laughs> and yes. all the other things yeah. um, instead of focusing on the how. Yes. And the reason why they did that was because they're afraid. Right. And we, are, we have this terrible fear associated with... We have all these false beliefs associated with God and that's where faith comes in. Yes. That, so a person is not going to pray unless they have some faith. And, uh, and obviously developing faith is a very difficult process if, if, if you haven't received any divine love. So, so at some point you're going to start with a blank, completely blank slate having no love in divine love entered your soul. You might have development in natural love, but no divine love because your will has to be engaged. To, to, your conscious will has to be engaged in receiving divine love. And it has to be the will of the soul, not the will of your mind that's engaged receiving divine love. So, so that might not be engaged at all. And then you have no faith that God exists, no faith in a loving God, no faith that God cares about you as an individual, no no, none of those things. So why are you going to have a longing under those circumstances? Well, for most people, that's the case. They don't have a longing because of all of those factors. But that's what depends on man. And what I wanted to do first in this discussion is focus on what depends on God first. Sure. And then what depends on man. Yeah. That... Because, because I feel that if people understood what depended, like the importance of receiving divine love in their soul, then a spark of desire will rise and then they might desire to pray, you know, at least to try the experiment. Yeah. Um, but for the majority of people, they do not understand the benefits of divine love in their life. They haven't even intellectually become aware of the possible benefits of divine love entering their soul. And as a result of that, they never develop a desire to receive it and they never work their way through issues of why they're not receiving it. And they never develop a, a longing to receive it and they don't have any faith. Mm. And, and so, unfortunately, religious viewpoints and spiritual viewpoints all are developed by their own ideas and concepts, but, but they're not involved with God. So, so, so divine love is not transforming their soul. They're just trying to transform their soul using natural love techniques. Mm -hmm. And even the majority of people that have heard the divine truth are doing that. Still, yeah. Mm. Even people who have an intellectual awareness are mm. often still living in their fears. Yeah. Um, so, just uh, one last question, then, perhaps about the love, about the love and mm. the how of the love, mm -hmm. how it's received. Um, you said earlier that divine love does not remove the error from our soul, no. and I wanted to um, maybe come back to that point. I know we'll talk about it more in the prayer and faith section, but just the very fact that you're saying our will must be engaged, mm -hmm. the love 
Can I point out to people firstly that yep. statement? There's a lot of people who are going to feel that's in disharmony with the pageant messages, but it's not. <laughs> Error is an effect of causes that are in the soul. Yes. Divine love removes the causes that produce the error. Great. That's what divine love does. So, so the error itself is not removed by divine love entering the soul. The cause of the error is removed by divine love entering the soul. Mm -hmm. And there's a very different, that's very different, right? Because for, for the majority of people, they don't understand the difference between cause and effect, but it's very important to understand. Sin is the effect of the soul acting out of harmony with love and of a condition within the soul where the soul desires to act out of harmony with love because of the different emotions and feelings that the soul has. When divine love is received into the soul, then the causes of these particular degradations, if you like, of the soul are removed. Right? And when the causes are removed, then the subsequent effect, sin, is no longer created. It, in effect, just disappears without any effort. It disappears without effort, yeah. yes. And if a person requires effort to change their behaviour on a certain issue, it means that the cause hasn't been removed. That means that they haven't received divine love on that particular, particularly with that surrounding that particular issue, enough to for the cause to actually be removed. Thank you. That's such an important point. I feel. Yeah. And it's also something else about the workings of divine love. It's just how powerful this love is yes. is that it can enter us and actually almost dissolve. It dissolves the cause of our acting out of harmony with love. Now that is, that's very powerful Yes, for me personally yep. and probably Joanne Bloggs. <laughs> <laughs> because it, if you think about it from a, 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 like a scriptural perspective or a religious perspective, what most religions on the planet are teaching us that we have to try. Mm -hmm. We have to try hard to do this. We have to fight the evil and fight off everything and we've got to try, try, try hard. The main reason why we have to try hard, unfortunately, is because divine love doesn't, is not entering our soul and transforming the cause. Mm -hmm. And so we're always working against the cause. Yeah. Like we, we know that we sin under that circumstance generally, and oftentimes we don't even know that we sin, but sometimes we know that we sin. And then where we know we sin, we know we're doing things out of harmony with love, but instead of trying to correct the cause, what we try to do is change the effects. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is work against the soul's cause, the, the thing that exists in the soul that causes us to take those actions. Now, divine love doesn't work that way. Divine love enters the soul and starts transforming the soul at the causal level, not at the effect level. Mm -hmm. So divine love doesn't correct sin. Divine love corrects the cause of sin. Mm -hmm. Which, wow, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? Very powerful. Because it means that in... One cause can create a multitude of sin. Of course. If we dissolve that one cause, then our life can change. And change markedly in short periods of time. Yes. And, and so that's, you know, along the way before we're even at one with God, yep. as we begin to receive the love, there will be a softening. There will be a change. There will be our life will begin to show evidence of this love. Of the love having the change to the causes. Yes. Yep. Now, of course... It is possible for us to still imbibe other errors into our soul that create other causes that we need to release. Yeah. So there are certain other things that we would also need to choose to do if we want to protect our soul from <laughs> receiving new causes, if you like, within it. Is this it, what that you mean sin. about acting in harmony with the love that we've already received? Of course. Yes. Yeah, there is, there is, there are, we must take action that's it, harmonious with the love we've already received once we've received it. But that action will be automatic unless we use our will counter to the automatic action that the love dictates. So the love will um, draw us towards more love by yes, its very nature. Yes, the love nature. will draw us into a certain course of action that our fear then screams mm. about and then we realise, oh, we've got fear still. All right? <laughs> yeah. Now, once we become one with God, we will have no fear. That will be, yes. And that would be a beautiful state that with no fear at all. But before that time, the, we, the, the soul is being drawn into act in harmony with love. And at the same time now, any fears that we have are going to go, 
uh, uh, I don't want to go in that direction, right? Yeah, yeah. And then we will need to choose to do something with these fears. And these fears have other causes. Yes. <laughs> that if we receive more love, the transformational effect on those causes will happen and the, these fears will start dropping off and disappearing. And this is where I want to ask you uh, an important clarifier about what you've just said. Mm -hmm. So you've just said to us that the love removes the cause. Yes. Now, you've also said that religion and a lot of other teaching out there is, is asking us to work on the effects of, of you know, the, the sins inside of us. Do better, try harder, fix it, yep. um, and you'll be a good person. Mm -hmm. Now, what I observe is a lot of people who've even listened to a lot of the videos that we produce and um, are attempting to follow this The way. path, as they call it. Yeah. Yes. Um, what I observe is a, a tendency to try to... F they they've heard intellectually there's a cause. Oh, well, they've heard... Let's even take it back further. They've heard intellectually that a certain course of action probably wouldn't be loving. Sure, okay. So, so in other words, they're looking at the effect of a certain course of action and they go, well, that wouldn't be loving. So what they then choose to do using their will, they choose to not take that action in the future. Yeah. Well, that does nothing to the soul. No. Nothing. Now, I do that, though, because I think if I oh, know can I, something... Can I just correct that? Yeah. It does one thing to the soul. Yeah. It just prevents further damage to the soul on taking an action that's yeah. out of harm you love. So that's why I do but, it. But, but, yeah, but it doesn't actually fix the cause of why we wanted to take that action... Exactly. To, to, ..that's out of harmony with love. It doesn't yeah. fix that. So if I know something's out of harmony with love and I feel a desire to do it, then I do. I say I'm not going to do that because I know that's going to lead to more error. But I also know there's a cause within me that drives that desire. Exactly. And unless I heal that, then... Who heals it? Well, this is, <laughs> this is exactly the, where I'm getting to. Exactly. Because I see a lot of us trying to heal the cause so then God can, we can receive the love. Yeah, but no. But what you've just said is we receive the love and that's what, what heals, heals the it. cause. And it's just our willingness and desire and passion to receive the love to heal that cause and our willingness to see the cause as a, that, that is the issue. We can't pray for repentance about an issue or a cause that we can't see. Yes. We need to see it so, and feel it. We need to feel how important it is. And when we feel how important it is and how great the issue is, we will desire love to come and heal that cause. Yes, and I just feel this is so. This is where we talk a lot about humility and truth mm -hmm. being the doorway to love. We must, from what you've just said, be humble to the fact that there's a cause there. That there's an error in my soul yes. that, that's out of harmony with love, that exists in my soul, that is creating all sorts of trouble in my life. That, that has a cause that's creating that's trouble. That's got a tr cause that's creating trouble. Yep, so I, I'm humble to the truth of that. I'm initially. humble to the truth of that. And I have to be willing to see it. Yes. Willing to notice it. Willing to see how bad it is. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. Willing God's to love can't feel... do any of that for me. No, I've got I have to do to be that. Willing to feel <laughs> what this thing is inside of me. Exactly. Don't I? But it's not up to me to, to cure it. To cure it. In fact, it's going to take me a long, long time to cure it on my own, isn't it? Well, that's the natural love path. If you t if you make it up to you to cure it on the natural love path, you'll cure it eventually. Mm -hmm. But it might take 100 years, sometimes with hard issues, thousands of years. Mm -hmm. We've seen people take tens of thousands of years to, for some issues. So, you know, it's a very slow, laborious process. If, if you allow, if, you, if you're open in all those ways that I've just mentioned and you're repentant and humble and you see the cause and you want to change it and you feel the need to change it and you, you truly desire change it and pray for God's love to come and take this cause away from you, then God's love can do all of that work for you. And it will expose a lot of emotion in mm -hmm. that process. You'll have to be willing to feel emotion. You'll have to be willing to cry. You'll have to be willing to go through different feelings, sometimes shame and other emotions too you might have to go through and be willing to experience it. But if you're willing to do all of that, God c can just get to that cause really rapidly and erase it yes. like God's love erases it. And now that cause is not generating any negative effects anymore in your life. Now, I suggest to people if, if they haven't experienced that change, that fairly rapid transformational change, then they're still engaging the natural love path because they don't really understand what the divine love path is. Mm. Yes. I feel a lot of people feel like, right, I have to 
I have to tip out all the error, then God's love can enter me. And really what you're saying is it can be a dynamic process where God's love comes, triggers things. If we're humble, the error yeah, if you Yeah, if you think about it from an illustration a perspective of a yes. glass of water, if, if, if I'm willing to tip out error as the, the stuff the coming in, comes in, then I don't have to wait for the error to all be gone before I can receive love. Yes. Right? So, so I'm not saying when I gave that illustration, I'm not saying you have to empty the glass completely before you receive love. What I'm saying is you have to have a willingness to let go of the error that causes you to no lo- not desire the love and, or, and also to not have any faith in God and not any, have any faith that you will receive it when you ask and also to work through the issues of why re- you resist it, yeah. why you resist the love. Now, now, obviously, if I've got a cap on there, <clears throat> God's love will never enter if that's my soul and I've got a cap on it and I'm not allowing myself to experience emotion at all. God's love can never enter. Sure. Like, I, God's love can only enter by me using my will to open up my soul. That's the operation of prayer. And we'll talk more, more about, about prayer in a minute. Yeah. But the operation of prayer is to open up your soul so that now you're, and also develop within you a willingness to tip out whatever is in there that's out of harmony with the love. And from what you're saying, all I have to do is open my soul ask for the love and have a willingness to tip out. And at that moment, I can start to receive love. Yes. Not after I've even done any tipping. Because as the love enters me, it's going to tip things out at a far more rapid rate. If, anyway, I, if I'm willing. If I'm willing. So this is the humility part of the this equation. This is the problem is that people receive some divine love and receive some divine love and receive a little bit more, a little bit more. But they, the love is now working against their will. Like when I say what I say, that they're willing to receive the love, but they're not willing to operate in harmony with the love they've received. Yeah. And when they do that, then they stagnate themselves. Then they can't receive any more divine love because they're operating in complete disharmony with receiving any more divine love. Yeah. So, so that is and, a big issue. And on the, other, on the flip side of that, if you like, so there you're talking about people who are not willing to tip out and they're just asking for love and that it gets stagnant because yeah. they don't have the willingness to... Yeah. On the other end, I see people trying to tip it out without involving God yet because they feel like it's got to be tipped out before I can get some in. And it's actually doing... But not only It's not only for that reason either. I feel for many, they're just addicted to self-reliance. Well, this is what I was going to say. That's self-reliant, isn't it? Yeah, and totally. God-reliance is when we ask for the love in this process constantly, all the time. We're in the experiment all All the time. time. While we're growing the soul qualities and the soul character that we need to follow the way, we're always, always asking for the love. Yes, Yes. always. And and you will know generally when you receive it because there will be emotional periods during the reception of this love where all of a sudden you become emotional about having received it. Mm-hmm. And those times are indications that you've received it. Now, if you're not receiving it, then you're not being honest. Mm-hmm. You're not being truthful with yourself. You're not being honest about whether you even have a pure desire to receive it. And, and this is where we need to get down to the other two aspects Let's of Solomon's message. Yeah. So, so I feel at this point in time, what I would love for everyone to understand is that God's love is going to have such a powerful effect on your life that you at this point in time cannot even imagine what that, that powerful effect will be. You, you, no amount of words that I give you are ever going to help you understand how important this love is to you. No amount of words that I can ever say will be able to illustrate to you how important this love is to your future existence. So all I can do is assure you that there are literally billions of changes that are going to happen to your soul when you receive divine love. And all I can do is reassure you that it's the most important thing you could ever, ever engage for your future existence. So, so, so maybe if we could sort of leave that part of Solomon's message there now, the importance of receiving the divine love, like Solomon correctly says, it is the greatest thing in all of the universe that comes from God, yeah. the greatest thing. Now, he's talking about greater than everything else you can ever imagine. <laughs> That's what he's talking about. So it's the greatest thing you could ever do and, or receive from God. And he's telling us that what, that's what comes from God, but on the part of us, in order to get it, we need two things. 
prayer, prayer and, faith. and faith. So let's, so let's talk, talk about, about prayer and faith. Yeah. <laughs> so can we talk about faith first? Yeah, I yeah. feel so. so. It's important to talk about faith first because without faith, prayer won't even be engaged. Yeah, yeah. So, so we need to have at least some way of developing our faith or some, some knowledge of what we're talking about when we're talking about faith. So what are we talking about? What, are, what is faith? Okay, so, so if we look at faith or the lack of it, and sometimes looking at the lack of it is, the, is a way to measure to what it means to it, yeah. help yeah. define it. Yeah. So if we look at the lack of faith, the lack of faith would be that I have no concept whatsoever and no uh, idea that God exists, no concept whatsoever that God's got any love to give me, no concept whatsoever that my soul can be transformed by receiving divine love, no concept whatsoever that uh, you know, there's any process that I can engage with God. Now, ironically... This is the condition that the majority of humanity find themselves in, even if they're religious, because they don't understand this divine love, the power of the, of the divine love. Mm. You know, they want to believe in my sacrifice, for example, as their saving mm. that saves them from their sins. Or they want to believe that worshipping six times a day to, to God is the way to save them from their yeah. sins. Or do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like there, there's all sorts of practices that people engage on the planet. You know, if you're looking at a new age person, they're thinking that there'll be some kind of energy of the universe, which is God. Is that, you know, not an entity, but an energy of the universe, which is God, that's going to come and somehow, you know, transform them in some way. None of that is true. Yeah. And the problem with all of those belief systems is they prevent us from having any faith in what is true. Mm. That's the problem of belief systems. So you're saying if we have faith in things that aren't true, it actually works degrades against. our faith. Yeah, really. it works against the operation of what we need to engage if we're going to receive divine love. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work in harmony with it. It works against it. Yeah. The, this is the power of our belief systems. Mm -hmm. Our belief systems exercised in a direction that's untruthful causes so much uh, opposition to love and even to our concepts that we even don't even try the experiment yeah. Yeah. because we don't believe the experiment exists yes. and we don't believe we need it. So if, so if I speak to an average Christian, for example, the average Christian believes the only thing they need to do to get a relationship with God is to believe in the sacrifice of Jesus, mm -hmm. right, and to live in harmony with the moral precepts of what they see as Christianity. That's all they feel they need to do. And I'm saying, no, that is not going to ever make you one with God, ever. And the problem with holding on to that belief is that you're not going to try to become one with God, mm -hmm. ever, probably, because you're going to hold on to this belief that somebody else has saved you mm -hmm. and created your relationship with God. For, for, for the average Muslim, they, they believe that praying to Allah regularly every day, living their life in harmony with the moral precepts of the Koran is going to be, help them become at one with God. I'm saying, no, it won't. Mm -hmm. No, it won't. To become at one with God, you must receive divine love. It's the only thing you can do to, be, to become at one with God. You can't do anything else. The average new age person believes that they can become at one with the universe, right, through a process of energetic healing and other things. I'm saying, no, I'm sorry, those are not true. Mm. It can, you cannot do that. You will never become at one with God like that. It's pointless even doing that, in fact, mm. is what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, that unless you have the correct concept of God and the correct concepts about, the, about God himself, how will you ever receive enough love from God? Because you'll always imply incorrect concepts to God. Right? So you're saying our faith has to be grounded in the truth about God and God's nature. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It has to be grounded in truth. And truth is logical. It's not stupid. The truth is not illogical. Mm -hmm. It makes reasonable sense. Like, I have taught nothing in history that does not make reasonable sense. Yeah. Right? The reality is my, the distortions of my teachings, which are contained in the Bible, are totally unreasonable. They're totally, of course, they make no logical sense. And any person who analyzes it with a clear mind will see that and so therefore doesn't believe it. Mm -hmm. And then they assume that that's the God that I'm talking about. And it's not. Like, the God I'm talking about is logical, reasonable. The God I'm talking about is the creator of our universe. He, he she, understands everything about the universe, including how we're made. Everything. Mm. It's not mysterious. It's not mysterious. And, and so every time I'm addicted to the mystery, 
I am not connecting to this God. I am not connecting to the creator of the universe because the creator of the universe wants to explain everything to us, wants to give us the truth of everything. And, and every time we are illogical, we are being completely out of harmony with the creator of the universe because the creator of the universe is completely logical in every single thing <laughs> he does. <laughs> so our faith then is based in the truth about God's nature. It's always logical. Yes. And this is the kind of faith that we can hope to build when, we, when we're working with... Well, the problem with faith is one... There's other problem with faith, and that is it will build as we grow in a relationship. Mm -hmm. But why do we begin the relationship? Well, this is where <laughs> we have to trust in something. You've got to trust in something. Don't we? You've we got to take to. a risk. Yes. You've got to take a risk that God is this <laughs> God that I'm portraying, not this false God that the world's religions have portrayed, not the false God that the, that, that the world's anti-religions have betrayed, not the false God that people like New Age movement and other movements like that have betrayed, but rather this God that wants to give you love and have a personal relationship with you. We need to at some point trust that. Yes. And if we don't trust it, we'll never begin to develop a desire to pray. So you're also then saying that our faith will involve initially a sense of risk. Yes, but it's not we... a high risk because the logical argument would dictate us taking the risk. Well, now, this is if we engage our intellect to help us, isn't it? Yes, but, but, emotionally... but we have to engage it with a clean slate. We have to engage our intellect, our logical argument, with, the, with this, with this uh, feeling inside of us that we're willing to accept the truth even though it's not our religious belief, that we're willing to accept the truth even though the Koran or the Bible or some other book doesn't say it, that we're willing to accept the truth logically that, that many of these books do not have in them. They have complete illogical arguments about God. Mm. And what we need to do is be able to give up these illogical arguments that we have about God and accept the logical arguments about God. Mm. And because we have so <coughs> many emotions attached to our history, to our upbringing, to all, that, all of our history and our upbringing... And our living in a society that approves of us and all of those issues... All of those things are actually attached to different belief systems that we have. Uh, that and cause us to believe false things about God. Yep. Yeah. So, so everything's going to get challenged in this process. <laughs> well, and that, this is why I feel um, engaging the experiment mm -hmm. daily can feel challenging and risky and strange initially because we... See, again, I would argue, though, that if it feels challenging, risky and strange, it's only because of errors that exist in our soul that are emotional that cause us to feel that it's risky, strange and challenging. That's what I was trying to say. It, it may... Because we have all these emotions in us, exactly. it's going to feel like this. It's got nothing to do with whether it is actually risky. How, how can it be risky? Like the reality is we've got the creator of the universe that is saying to us personally, I want to have a relationship with you. And he's saying to us personally, I'm a loving person. I'm better than every one of you down there. You know, I'm, better, I'm a better person than any one of you can conceive at this point in time. Trust that I am. Mm -hmm. Look, I created your body. I created things like happiness, love, sex and other pleasures that you have. Surely you can see that if I created such things that I must be better than any one of you, <laughs> right? Because what do you create? You go and create pain and suffering and other things, you know, like that's what you create. Yeah. So, so I'm better than that. I'm, I'm a better God than that. And, and God's constantly showing through the universe to us, if we're willing to see, that, that God is actually far better than what we imagine God to be. And really, when we have faith in the truth about God, we have faith that God's not expecting us to be perfect before he loves us. No, God's God, not, God lets us make mistakes all the time. God's We're okay to. with mistakes. Yeah. Now, see, most people do not have that emotion within them no. because of their upbringing. But well, if we're, we we're, have faith, Yeah, and you can see why in their upbringing because yeah. when, when they were a child, every time they made a mistake, usually they got punished or humiliated or pulled down in some way. So, of course, when they become an adult, they're just absolutely petrified of making a mistake. God lets us make any mistakes. Like, why wouldn't a loving parent let you make a mistake and go, oh, now you're receiving the results of that mistake <laughs> through, you know, the law. Yeah. You're receiving the results of that mistake. So change it and don't make the same mistake again. Yeah. That know? doesn't mean that you're um, 
you know, that you're not going to get the love. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so this, I suppose, is uh, what faith can give us, is if we have faith that's based in the truth about God's nature, yeah. then it challenges the errors that we have inside of us. Automatically. About love automatically. Yeah. And we, even though it might feel a little strange, faith will actually give us the will to ask for love if we feel like, we don't know what this is going to be like or we don't even think we deserve it. But faith will actually draw us over that point and begin and have us begin to ask. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Can yeah. I just stop our discussion for a moment? Yeah. yeah.